Hey everybody, real fast before the episode begins, I just want to let you know to stick around after the numbers for a trailer for next week's Kill Count. Reminder that trailers will now go at the end of each Kill Count episode instead of being their own separate short video. Because YouTube doesn't like that, and I have to abide by the holy algorithm. Alright, enjoy the video. Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today is my birthday! So naturally, I'm looking at Happy Birthday to Me, a Canadian film released in 1981. Made by the same producers as the same year's My Bloody Valentine, Happy Birthday to Me is another early 80s slasher themed around a holiday. I've already covered several of these in various episodes of The Kill Count, but it seems like there are always more to discover. I don't mind. There's something charming about early slasher slashers, especially the ones made by competent filmmakers. Happy Birthday to Me, for instance, was directed by British filmmaker J. Lee Thompson, who made the original Cape Fear and some of the later Planet of the Apes sequels. Thompson brings an air of maturity to Happy Birthday to Me, a story about a group of college kids being killed off one by one. Sounds familiar, sure, but there is an interesting twist here. The main character, birthday girl Ginny, suffers from trauma-induced memory loss, and she keeps blacking out at pivotal points in the story. Now, this is a slasher that's focused on creative kills for its characters, but it also delivers well-crafted sequences of tension. The characters getting killed may not be the most complex individuals, but they do feel grounded and realistic enough to fear for. Despite these relative strengths, though, the movie doesn't quite capture my heart. It's a bit too slow, there's easily 10 or 15 minutes that could be cut here, and the screenplay feels undercooked, with confusing sequences meant to surprise the audience, but in actuality only confuses them. The big twist ending, especially, feels tacked on and unbelievable. Seems like the many people credited with writing this thing wanted an unpredictable twist, logic be damned. In the end though, this is still a solid, respectable slasher, and watching it's a much better time than having people sing happy birthday to you. If you did want to listen to the happy birthday song though, you could do so on some earbuds from today's sponsor, Raycon. Raycon earbuds are a stylish way to get premium sound delivered directly to your ear drums. And with their noise isolating sound, seamless Bluetooth pairing, and six hours of playtime, they also make for a perfect birthday gift. I use mine all the time when I'm doing simple tasks, like when I have to organize kill count props. So many props. To enjoy Raycon's comfortable earbuds for 15% off, go to buyraycon.com slash deadmeat. Not only do they lack dangling stems, they also lack dangling risks. Because if you don't love them, return them for free in 45 days. That's buyraycon.com slash deadmeat, the link's in the description, for 15% off your order today. Will there be enough deaths in this movie to match how old I am? At 32, probably not, but let's find out for sure and get to the kills. The movie begins with its mysterious and menacing score, composed by Bo Harwood and Lance Rubin. We're at a college town pub, The Silent Woman, where the most popular students of Crawford Academy gather to socialize. These kids, who include Bernadette O'Hara here, have such an inflated sense of importance, they've got a self-styled click name. The Crawford Top Ten. Isn't that what the elite of the senior class like to call themselves? You know what my self-styled click name was? LNGD, which stood for Losers, Nerds, Geeks, and Dorks. That's a true fact. We made shitty videos. This has been an LNGD production. Yash. Anyway, that lady's the Dean of Crawford, Mrs. Patterson, who I had hoped would be a bigger part of this movie, but she's not. As you probably guessed, the opening segment sees Bernadette attacked by an unseen killer. The sequence is suspenseful, and I like how much Bernie fights back, but like most of this movie, although it's better than you might expect, it goes on for just a bit too long. Eventually, the killer catches up with Ms. O'Hara and kills her with a quick slit of the throat. Bernadette's burn of death causes her to miss pub times with the rest of the Crawford Top Ten, which includes Virginia Ginny Wainwright, played by Melissa Sue Anderson of Little House on the Prairie fame. By this point, she had starred on the NBC Western for the better part of a decade, and the 18-year-old's decision to star in a slasher was a little controversial. The Top Ten also includes a nerd named Alfred Morris, who gets teased by the others, but they can shut the fuck up, because I don't see them bringing a cute pet rat to the party. Now, don't
Don't worry, George here is a real good ratty boy, and he doesn't get stepped on or killed. Worse that happens, he's putting a sign of what's probably not real beer, as the top 10 pranks a bunch of Freemasons or Shriners or whatever. That wascally top 10 always starting destructive bar fights and playing that game of theirs. You know the one, where you drive full speed across a bridge that's going up to jump on over to the other side? Are you fucking serious with this shit? This is so dangerous! And from a stunt perspective, so awesome! The bridge gets too drawn for Steve Maxwell, but Greg Hellman, who you could've Yes, just by looking at him, dares to attempt the jump anyway, despite Ginny crying for him not to. No, Greg, no! Not the car! Yo, Greg, for real though! Oh my god, this stunt! Haha, <laughs> Greg, dude, you just fucked up your car! Oh, wow! You made it! Yeah, with like 6,000 bucks worth of damage to his whip. Look at this destruction, Rudy! How are you about to cheerfully say he made it? You made it! God, that line is the best. The landing is not without its difficulties, and Ginny, rightfully pissed, runs away from her friends into the woods. Only her best friend, Ann Thomerson, is able to sympathize. She notes that Ginny's new to the school, so she's not familiar with their car-smashing game. The rest of them, though, are like, fuck it, let her go. She's okay, she just lives over there. This man is killing me, y'all. Ginny's mother, Estelle, who died six years ago, is buried out here, and Ginny tells the gravestone to be proud of her for being cool and popular. Now. They like me, Mom. They really like me. Ginny has no memory of what happened when her mom died, and to try to recover those memories, she's recently convinced her dad, Hal, to move them back into their old home. Hal's played by Lawrence Dane, last seen on the kill count in Bride of Chucky, where he saw some crazy shit go down before getting a face full of bloody baby doll. He doesn't want Ginny digging up her old memories. He'd rather they move on and live their lives as daddy and daughter. I love you, Daddy. I love you, too. Okay, why y'all being weird about it? Hal's far from the weirdest dude in Ginny's life, though. One of her friends, Etienne, which is a great name for an octopus, by the way, sneaks into her house after earlier grabbing her arm like a big old douche. But after finding her panties on the floor and possibly peeping at her tom-toms, Etienne leaves Ginny's room without her ever seeing he was there. The top ten's just the fucking worst at school, coming to class late and messing up the teacher's hair. Probably shouldn't be trying that shit with Professor Raiden there, Rudy. Pay attention! man, he's trying to science you about frog legs. A lesson that reactivates some latent memories for Ginny. You can tell because she starts glowing red. In this blast from the past, Ginny sees herself in an MRI looking machine and uttering a clue about what happened to her and her mom. My, 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 my birthday. She tells her new memory to her therapist, Dr. David Faraday, who's played by freaking Glenn Ford, a big star of the 40s and 50s. He was a Gilda, for God's sake. David admits that, yeah, she was part of a science experiment. But hey, looks like it's working, right? Today I remembered. Yes. And tomorrow, you will remember more. You know, I'm really happy for her brain right now. I just wish there weren't so many weird dudes in her life. I won't let anything or anybody hurt you. Like, the words he says are fine, but that quivering tone is questionable. And then he does this weird muttering to himself thing? No, I won't. Am I supposed to not trust this guy? Speaking of creeps, Etienne the Home Invader is also a dirt bike racer. Thus why his stunt double did that badass bridge jump earlier. He wins his race in the admiration of his friends, though he quickly burns his favor with Ginny when he shows her proof of his bedroom visit. Why is every guy around her so weird? That means you too, Alfred. I'm not swayed by your Steve Zissou get up. Before heading to the pub for celebratory drinks, Etienne tends to his bike and gets visited by the killer, who's still rocking those giallo gloves. The mystery murderer kills Etienne by throwing his scarf into the running tire. It pulls the Frenchman's head in and leaves it nothing but a bloody stuff. Sacre bleu! When neither Etienne nor Alfred show up at the silent woman, Ginny and her best friend Anne decide to see if Alfred's home. They break right the fuck in and snoop around, then find Bernadette's severed head! Oh my god! Oh good, Alfred's here. Explain yourself, young man! He tells them not to freak out, because this head is just a fake one. Nothing to be worried about at all here, ladies. All good. He laughs it off while Ginny seems disturbed, and Anne starts singing Queens of the Stone Age. I think it's... Sick. 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 With two members of the top ten suddenly missing, Dean Patterson's through dealing with their bullshit. You and all your gang, 
You think that because you are rich, you can sneer at people who have had to work hard. Hell yeah, lady, be in this movie more. I'd rather watch her than the remaining top eight. Like, good job, kids, you're a MySpace thing now. No wonder they keep arguing over who likes who. And the fight leaves Rudy so mad, he ends up looking like a blow pop. That Greg dude takes his car home, which somehow has a front grill attached, and pumps some iron in his bedroom gin. Nice bench, dude. Though it'd be best if you had a spotter. Oh, hey, perfect. Oh, it's you. Yeah. Yeah, you! The spotter! You loads up Greg with a whole bunch of weight, but unfortunately you's the worst spotter of all time. In another well-done suspenseful kill scene, the murderer forces Greg to lose control of the bar by dropping a weight plate on his dick. I think you found your max, dude. I guess this click covers the campus clubs completely, cause looks like Rudy is a soccer star. Oh, and Alfred is too. That little weirdo's the goalie! Good job, little weirdo! Rudy wins the game for the school and asks Ginny out, then takes her to the chapel where they head upstairs to the bell tower. There, Ginny says that she's not entirely new to Crawford. She went here years ago, before her mom died. Well, it was just for a few weeks, but... They've all forgotten. Instead of even feigning to care, Rudy just jumps around acting like Quasimodo. Give me a little kiss. Nah, I, I'm good. They see the bell rope for the chapel below, and Rudy suggests they cut it as a prank. And then things get inexplicably weird. Virginia, I've got a knife. I don't know what flipped all of a sudden here, and the movie doesn't bother to make things clear. It just cuts to blood dripping onto the chapel floor. All of a sudden, Ginny's running through a hospital, triggering more flashbacks of when she was getting the old noggin tinkered with. This brain surgery went so poorly for Ginny that the surgeon ended the operation sounding like Dr. McCoy. She's dead. Yeah, that flashback is great and all, Jin Jin, but what the fuck happened in the bell tower with you and Rudy? I don't know. Hey, don't be like that. I was just asking about Rudy, okay? He made me laugh that one time. You made it! <laughs> he certainly did, Rudy. Dr. David goes to Crawford, where the police are investigating the missing students, and tries to get Ginny to explain what really happened in the bell tower. But hold up, dude. I think the cops found something outside. Hey, everybody! I think they found something outside! Well, tell the whole goddamn world, why don't ya? Outside, the cops find a skull from the science department, because I guess this whole thing's a joke? <laughs> Yeah, being played by Rudy, who just nearly broke his neck to get a scare out of Ginny. Hi there. Rudy, where have you been? Rudy finally gives us some clarity about what happened in the bell tower. Ginny got weird and ran away, and he cut his hand while fucking around with the bell rope. That's why there was blood. That's all that was. Confusing ass movie. The next time Ginny visits her mother's grave, she's unwittingly followed by Alfred the head stuffer. He's eager to show her his pair of black leather gloves, but Ginny doesn't care for black leather gloves! And Alfred dies from a pair of garden shears to the gut. Oh, what? Are we supposed to feel bad because he had a flower for her? Gotta tell you guys, you went about giving it to her in the worst possible way. The next morning, Ginny's dad needs to leave suddenly on account of business! But his business might keep him away from home all weekend including Sunday. Sunday? Your birthday. Hal says he'll be back in time, but, you know, doubt, then leaves his obviously unwell daughter all by her lonesome in their giant home. Happy birthday. World's greatest dad right there. The Crawford dance is disco AF, with the remaining friends pairing up in various ways. A couple swap lands Ginny in the arms of Steve Maxwell, who suggests they get out of there. She's into the idea. I make real good midnight snacks. You hungry? Steve goes to Ginny's to lounge by her fire and enjoy some kebabs. And if anyone's ever been in a video store horror aisle, they know what's coming next. He gets a little bit of face sucking in, but then meets his end when Ginny stabs him through the mouth with a kebab. You know, I'm a little disappointed that the video box art isn't actually a shot in the movie. It's misleading. Another morning for Ginny means another fugue state. Last night? What the hell was last night? I don't remember anything. Her best friend Ann Thomerson comes over to check on her, and as she lets herself in, Ginny takes a shower. The running water unrepresses another memory, one of her and her mom driving angrily through the rain. The very upset Estelle wound up getting their car stuck on the same bridge that her trust fund friends would later smash their vehicles across. The movie gives us another awesome car stunt when they go ahead and drop Ginny's car from the bridge. It's so good they show it various times at different angles. 
and I'm so, so grateful that they do. Dropping a car off a bridge, good for that! The car sinks underwater, an absolute nightmare, and Ginny's mom helps her to escape. Estelle is stuck though, so she remains inside and drowns in the car. The mystery of her death has finally been revealed. And it helps explain Ginny's severe reaction to the bridge game. Ginny comes out of that flashback and finds herself in the bathroom with water all over the floor, because Anne's body is in the tub! Oh no, Ginny, she was your best friend! Ginny has Dr. David over, but when he looks in her bathroom, they find a clean tub. Like, really clean. Great maintenance there. The therapist gives Ginny a drink by the fire, a totally normal thing for a therapist to do, and congratulates her on remembering the bridge accident, but there's still brain work to be done. See, what we've got to find the link between your trauma and your friends. Aw oh, man, brain work today. But Doc, it's her birthday. It's my birthday. See? Anne's abandoned car is found by the entire damn police force, including an officer who probably shouldn't be trying to walk down that hill. Don't fall, guy! They try to question Ginny, but Dr. David shoes them away, saying he's watching over her in her home until her dad returns. Oh, carry on then. Nothing questionable about that. David uses a news article about Ginny's missing friends to trigger another memory. This one of her birthday six years past, when her mom planned a party with a prestigious guest list. Bernadette O'Hara, Etienne Vercourt, Steve Maxwell, Alfred Morris, Greg Hellman, and Anne Thomason. Six of the richest. Nothing but the best for my little girl. The kids no-showed, as did Ginny's dad, who called her in a split diopter shot to tell her he couldn't make it. You know, on account of BUSINESS! The other kids didn't come because they were at Ann Thomerson's party instead, which Ginny wasn't invited to because back then, she wasn't part of the popular crowd. Mom, they don't even know me! Infuriated, Estelle drove over to the Thomerson home, where she was stopped outside by their gatekeeper. We learned that Estelle had been the mistress of Ann's father, and he had paid her to keep the affair hush-hush. That money is how Estelle paid for Ginny to go to Crawford. You can send your little girl to the Crawford Academy, but that ain't gonna change who you are. You know, Crazy Mom is a pretty tired character trope, but Sharon Acker kills this role, and helps highlight the movie's socioeconomic themes. I'm a rich woman now, and I found this shovel in their faces! <laughs> Back in the present, Ginny runs away crying, leaving Dr. David all alone in her room. Next thing you know, there's a fire poker in play, and the doc gets his head cracked open all over the wall. Damn, she really painted the room with that dude, huh? In the most surprising twist of this bizarre-ass movie, Ginny's dad Hal actually shows up in time for her birthday. Inside his house, he finds blood everywhere and freaks out, thinking about the cleaning costs alone. He then runs around outside in the film's most drawn-out sequence, discovering Dr. David's body in his late wife's grave. He also runs into one of the Crawford top ten, Amelia, just kinda standing there, getting all wet. Amelia was Greg's gal, and an early cut of the film featured her getting killed with an axe to the head. But the MPAA kept rating this movie X until they finally agreed to cut that kill. So all we're left with of her character is this confusing moment that doesn't go anywhere. It's worth noting that two other top ten members, Rudy and Maggie, also disappeared from the movie after the dance scene. It kinda makes sense that these three avoided the slaughter, since they were not named as guests invited to Ginny's birthday party all those years ago. But it still feels weird to focus on a top 10 friend group if you're not gonna go ahead and kill them all in your slasher. Hell makes his way back inside, where it's finally time to get this party started. So many people have come to your daughter's birthday, dude, including your dead wife. Oh man, that's messed up. And I've got a feeling things ain't gonna be getting any more normal anytime soon. Happy birthday to me. Good singing though. Hal looks around and gets some close-up inserts of his daughter's dead friends, which you always gotta do in these dinner from hell scenes. Or, I guess this one's more of a dessert from hell scene. Ginny thanks her dad for making it on time and sets him down at the table. Here, wear this. She makes a wish and blows out the candles and then blows out her daddy's life force by slashing him across the neck. Aw, we don't get a face full of cake? That'd have been fun. Well, that's gotta be just about it for this movie, right? Kinda tropey plot about a girl having some kind of mental breakdown. Ginny's been the killer all along. We get it, we get it. Wait, what the fuck? That's Ginny. I don't get it. Dear little sister. 
sister? Yeah, buckle up, folks. We've got some twists ahead. Melissa Sue Anderson pulls parent trap duty for a mo, playing Ginny and her doppelganger sister in the same shot. Only turns out her sister's not a doppelganger. She was wearing a mask. In actuality, the killer's been Ann Thomerson this whole time, Ginny's best friend, who now reveals that she's her half-sister. In actuality, actuality, though, Ginny was originally going to be the killer. Kinda. It was going to be revealed that she had killed all her friends while being periodically possessed by the vengeful spirit of her dead mom. The filmmakers thought that would be too predictable, so they pulled this shit last minute, making Anne the killer, only she's been wearing an impossibly realistic Ginny mask the whole time. I dressed like you, walked like you, I even talked like you. And I thought the Scream 3 voice changer was bad. This last minute ending doesn't make a lot of sense, but apparently Ginny's mom Estelle was also the mother of Anne. I mentioned that Anne's dad had been having an affair with Estelle, and we learn now that Anne was born out of that affair, making her and Ginny half-sisters. Anne's family was destroyed when her legal mom found out about Estelle, and now she's getting revenge by ruining Ginny's life. It's kind of like a Scream 1 situation, I suppose, where Billy was targeting Sydney because her mom had been sleeping with his dad. Anne did all this with a Ginny mask that Alfred had lying around, since he's weird like that, and knocked out Ginny with chloroform to cause a blackout before each kill. That's why Ginny had no memories of the murders. But something tells me she's gonna remember them now. Anne tries to complete her plan of vengeance, but instead Ginny stabs her in the stomach with a knife. The first time Ginny Wainwright has actually killed someone. Bad timing then, when the movie ends with a cop arriving. Yeah, this'll be a tough one to explain, birthday girl. How many people showed up dead to Ginny's birthday bash? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Oh, birthday jump scare! Nine people died in Happy Birthday to Me, and with six male victims and three female victims, this party had a two to one ratio of dudes. With a bloated runtime of 111 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 12 and a third minutes. I'll give the Golden Chainsaw for coolest kill to Greg Hellman. Steve's death may be the famous photo on the video cover, but Greg's comes after a scene with some nicely constructed tension. And it also speaks to a personal fear of mine. Can't lift a failure by yourself, dude. The all machete for lamest kill will go to Alfred Morris, just because it feels the least inspired and horrifying. And that's it. Happy Birthday to Me came out in 1981 and is something of a cult classic nowadays. For my birthday, I'd love it if you spread the word about Dead Meat and or followed me on social media, at Dead Meat James on Twitter and Instagram. I never plug that stuff in kill counts, but let me do it today. Until next time, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. For the next Kill Count. Attention dead meat viewers, they are coming to get you. Ghouls, the living dead, known to many as zombies. They are coming to get you. Your homes are not safe. Your vehicles are not safe. Your fellow man is not safe. They are coming to get you. But we're safe in here. Don't be ignorant. Prepare yourself. Watch George A. Romero's Night of the Living Dead, the first ever modern zombie flick, before it's revisited on the kill count next week. It's on, it's on. That's right. It's the first ever kill count remake. But it's not a kill count on the Night of the Living Dead remake. This is the original. It's black and white. It's got ghouls, and they are coming to get you. There's gonna be 20, 30, maybe 100 of those things, and as soon as they know we're here, this place is gonna be crawling. The Night of the Living Dead kill count. It's coming to get you, again. Night of the Living Dead can currently be watched on the pictured streaming platforms. Demi always recommends you watch the movie for yourself before it's kill count. It's the only way to have your own properly informed opinion. Kill counts are never meant to replace the experience of watching a film. Thanks a lot for watching this birthday kill count for happy birthday to me. Once again, please hit me up on social media at Dead Meat James on Twitter and Instagram. I use Twitter a lot and I've been trying to use Instagram more with like close up pictures of the set and stuff. Oh, I should probably take those pictures right now, huh? Oh yeah, that's a nice shot. That was real nice. Oh, also, fucking ring the bell bullshit. Do that, because otherwise you might not get notified when I release a video. Just gotta dance for the YouTube gods. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Be good people.